Hey, welcome to the For Evansville podcast, a podcast where we talk about the needs and dreams of our city and the people who are working towards a flourishing Evansville in creative or just unknown ways. My name is Adrian, and today Jonathan and I were talking to Robin Mallory. She's the co-founder of Zero Waste Evansville and the former executive director of Urban Seed. So in this episode, you might actually hear her refer to herself as the executive director, but we recorded this episode a while ago, and she has since retired from that position. She was also an integral part of Market on Main's creation and implementation, so if you head down there on Wednesdays, you have her to thank for that. She has a passion for food justice in our community and fighting for kids to have access to healthy foods, which you'll learn more about in just a few seconds. As always, give us a like and follow wherever you're streaming this from and join the conversation by following For Evansville on Instagram. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much for being here, uh, Robin. We really appreciate it and are looking forward to talking with you about um, your involvement in Evansville and just kind of what you bring to the city. Um, so to, to get started, maybe just introduce yourself to our guests, um, let them know who you are and maybe how long you've been in Evansville and a little bit about what you do. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robin Mallory. I moved to Evansville in the fall of 2013. We came here for my husband's job. We left Northern California. So I still hear from people, why did you leave NorCal? Or how on earth did you end up in Evansville? Uh, truth be told, we didn't know a soul here and we hadn't even heard of Evansville. We'd certainly sure. heard of Indiana, but the job offer came in. Uh, we were very happy in Northern California, had a rich life there, you know, in terms of friends and our work. But uh, we were ready for a change, and we have loved every minute of living here. Um, I, I get so much feedback from the various uh, initiatives and, and fun things that I do here. Folks that have lived here all their life often say to me and my husband, you know, you've done more in these few years that you've been here than I've done my entire life living here. So we... Um, well, first of all, I get to be a full-time volunteer, so that's been a real blessing. Um, the cost of living in the Midwest is a lot different than California. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we didn't even really know that. So uh, after a couple months, it became apparent to us that, that I, I had already gotten my nursing license. I'm a trained nurse, uh, health educator. But it became apparent that I would get to be able to stay as a volunteer, and that has been such a blessing to me. Uh, but we're avid outdoors people. So okay. we, we love, we love well, not so much the Ohio River. <laughs> That's a lot different than the Sierra, you know, snow melt that I'm used to. But right. um, nonetheless, uh, we're bike riders and birders and hikers, and this is a beautiful part of the country. Yeah. Um, what are some of your favorite places to go for outdoor activities in this area? Well, we... We love riding here. First of all, it's flat, which is just a miracle still <laughs> after all these years. So, yeah. so that's nice. Uh, we uh, so so riding locally is right from our garage. You know, it's always wonderful. Uh, but we do a lot of hiking, looking for wildflowers and birds. Um, Lincoln State Park is mm -hmm. newly discovered to us the last couple of years, and we just love it there. Uh, we love Hemlock Cliffs uh, locally, Wesselman, of course. In fact, oh, I yeah. won't tell you now, but I have a Wesselman story. It literally was one of the reasons we decided we could move to Evansville oh, really? because wow. we just we just fell in love with the place. Yeah, um, and we are travelers. Thankfully, where where our resources allow us to travel. We came from my husband's job, as I mentioned, and he has weekends and evenings off. He didn't used to have that mm. back in Northern California. So we go away all the time. And, yeah. uh, you know, within an hour and a half of here in, in the Hoosier Forest and uh, up by Bloomington, uh, uh, you know, there's just so many places to hike and do fun things. Yeah. So we, we do it. We're really enjoying it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. I love, yeah. I love hearing from people who have moved from out of town because I always think that they're going to say that they don't like Evansville. But we have seen time and time again that everyone that moves, we've had a couple actually from California mm -hmm. join us uh, and say that they absolutely love it here. Yes. And so I want to know like what made you decide that you loved Evansville? And you can share that Wesselman story. 
Well, that's so we came for a long weekend at the end of May in 2013. And my husband, who uh, researches travel destinations just mm. I- incredibly uh, in detail, um, we he had, Westland was on our radar as as a you know forest area, but also for birds. And May is a good time to look for birds in the mm. Midwest. And we are early morning people, no surprises there. And we we showed up at Westland at like six, and it was before they had the big new entrance way, and we just kind of walked in and stepped over the little chain that was meant to really kind of keep you out <laughs> of the forest. Right. Um, and we went for a run, which you're really not even allowed to do. We didn't notice yeah. that at the time. So we ran through this forest and were just so touched by how beautiful yeah. and, and luscious it is, which is so different than the Sierras with the, all the pines and mm-hmm. oaks. And um, so the hardwood forest was just lovely. And uh, later we found out that you really weren't supposed to be in there and you're not supposed to run. <laughs> uh, but we thought, you know, this place is really beautiful. So yeah. we, we can... Um, that that was one reason we came here. The other was um, River City Food Co-op, which I, I've been teaching nutrition and food as medicine for decades. Uh, and for me, it was important to be able to have a source for locally grown produce and, and just, you know, places that supported natural foods. So mm-hmm. uh, I had found the co-op online. It's unfortunately since closed, but that was a real attractor to me. I knew we could be fed while we were here. Um, and the people were just lovely. As I said, we didn't know a soul. So so we, we, we went to big box stores. I wanted to get the vibe. You know, I was a little nervous about the Midwest in terms of some of the more conservative way of thinking, which, which isn't how we look at the, at life. Uh, and again, not judging people, but I just wanted to be sure that it felt comfortable and warm and inviting. Mm. Uh, so we we just kind of observed and looked around. We came back for a week in uh, the end of June and really focused on looking and uh, started checking out real estate and, you know, can we do this? And we are happy people. We just decided, you know, we, we, we can do this and we'll just make it work. And I had already met some farmers in the interim period, so I knew that there was some good food being grown here. I know it sounds silly, but I, I don't shop in big box stores, so uh, for me it was important to have a source of local food. And I started uh, having conversations with folks from Urban Seeds, and that, I'm actually mm-hmm. the director of Urban Seeds. It's a nonprofit, really impactful, meaningful work. I'm very, very dedicated to the work we do, but at the time, I had no thought that I'd be a board member, let alone ultimately sure. move into a director role. Uh, so it just felt like we could make it work here. Hmm. And we have. You know, my husband loves his job. And so so that part is just marvelous. And as I said, nights and weekends off, which which was we still can't believe. Yeah. Uh, but we have made some dear friends here. I've gotten involved in so many aspects of Evansville, um, besides the food justice work, which, as I said, is just a perfect fit for me. Uh, I You probably know Mary Allen because everybody knows mm-hmm. Mary Allen. Yeah. Right. Uh, she's become a dear friend, and we co-founded Zero Waste Evansville. We're really dedicated to minimizing the impact of single-use disposables here in the community. Uh, I, I got involved with some local political campaigns. Uh, so I, I am busier now as a full-time volunteer than I was in my professional life when I worked full time. Yeah. So the Philharmonic. So here, here's a story. We were, we went to the Master Garden uh, again back in our uh, first or second visit here. And we saw this very mature couple like, you know, in their 80s who were gardening. And we got, started talking with them and they thought, oh, if you're going to move here, you've got to check out the Philharmonic. So we were kind of laughing because we our reference point was San Francisco, Bay Area, you know, for entertainment oh, yeah. and, you know, all things cultural. And we thought, yeah, Phil Herm. I, and we, so we showed up in uh, the end of September, October, went to our first Philharmonic in, in early October. And I was in tears at the Victory Theater. Oh, I'm probably getting tears now. But not only is the Victory Theater just spectacular, yeah. but it was such high caliber. Yeah. So we have been season, you know, season ticket holders ever since. We love the culture here, love the UE Theater, USI, mm-hmm. the movie nights. Um, 
you know, there's just so much going on here. We're not bluegrass people, which is sort of on the edge of being sacrilege in <laughs> Evansville. I, I know that. Right. But but there's just so much happening here, yeah. you know, from a cultural perspective. And uh, uh, still a lot to get used to. It still sometimes stuns me how different I am or my perspectives might be. But um, we have just really, you know, embraced the community and we feel embraced. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah. It's it's so funny that you mentioned the Philharmonic because I think you're the third or fourth the third. Yeah, the third. person who has brought that up well. as like uh, people who have come mm-hmm. to Evansville from somewhere else and just been blown away yes. by the Philharmonic. And uh, I think for people who are from Evansville, um, it, we don't tend to see it as anything really special or I yeah, don't know if the assumption is, it. well, everybody probably has this or something, but uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear so many people like talk about how spectacular and high caliber, as you like said, the Philharmonic is. Oh, yeah. please, please do. Yes. And, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, when we first moved and started going, my husband used to tell our friends back in California that our season tickets were less expensive than a weekend in the Bay Area, yeah. and, and that parking was more expensive than two nights, you know, at, at the <laughs> Philharmonic. So p- parking in San Francisco. Right. So, uh, yeah, we just love it, and and it's it is really yeah. you know, high quality music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we missed all last season. We we had our tickets. We we donated happily. Um, we didn't go into the venue at all, sure. of course. But um, looking forward to next year. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in the Victory Theater, as you said, is really beautiful, yes. and I think it's some. It's one of those things that's easy to um, to take for granted if you uh, if you're just from here and you're around it all the time and you don't know. And, so. and I I have a lot of young friends here, which is different than where we used to live, uh, and I think it's just because of the activist work that I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. So many of them, I, I can't say they're unhappy here, but they look for ways to leave Evansville or they, they lament that they've been here for 25 or 30 years sure. or something. And uh, we will happily retire here and, you know, just, yeah, keep on yeah. doing what we're doing. That's great. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about Urban Seeds. Um, I imagine Happy a lot of people are hearing about that for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, so share with us kind of what's the what's the mission of Urban Seeds? What kind of work do you guys do? Our mission is, we well, we advocate for food justice. We are always looking for ways to increase access to nourishing food for everyone in our community. I think the pandemic has highlighted the disparity in access, but, but even prior to the pandemic, many people didn't understand the depth of hunger in this community, mm-hmm. the fact that so many children go to bed undernourished, uh, and the foods that are made available to many of our families who are challenged is a very low nutritional value. Mm-hmm. So as I mentioned, my background is is food is medicine. I've been a cardiovascular and diabetes nurse forever. Uh, when I recognize the high levels of obesity, the disparity in access related to poverty, zip code, any number of socioeconomic factors, I just saw this place where I could be and, and make some kind of a difference. Yeah. But at the same time, I also see and and continue to be uplifted by the receptivity in the community you, you know the fact that that there's so many people who are now engaged in making a difference around mitigating hunger to increase access you know one of the more tough conversations that we've had is there is a big difference between filling empty bellies and embracing our moral obligation to fill those empty bellies with nourishing food. Mm -hmm. There is a plethora of gas station convenience stores where many people are relegated to shop because that's all they have in their neighborhood. And they're having to buy processed foods, very low nutritional value, very high in processed carbohydrates, Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, additives in there that aren't good at all for children's brain chemistry. And when some of us who don't know enough see that families are being fed, they, they feel good about, oh, I've contributed a, a case of this or I've contributed dollars towards this. But if we don't elevate the conversation around the level of nutrition value in food, our community will miss an opportunity to raise the next generation of leaders in a way that will 
be flourishing and thriving. Yeah. Um, so that that conversation, when I first started bringing that point up, was met with some pushback, and I might have been a little mm, passionate uh, in the <laughs> beginning. And yeah. I, although I'm still passionate about it, I, I found my voice around that particular topic. Uh, so when I have a chance to get in front of a church group or a, a social group or a, a community club or, or organization, it's not about filling up a barrel with with Top Ramen or Mac and Cheese or Campbell's, but let's spend a few more dollars and really look at the nutritional value of those foods. So there's that piece to it that we want to, that we have embraced as educators in the community. Another piece that's that uh, I have come to learn so much about, but so many people don't understand, is that there are numerous thousands of families in this community that only have a microwave oven. That is their main source of mm. of, of cooking, cooking in parentheses, if you will. Um, sure. They, they or their Vectron bill is so high that they can only turn it on in the beginning of the month because they can't ramp up the bill towards the end of the month. Yeah. Or they have one single pot or pan and and very, you know, a uh, few numbers of utensils. And many of us live with abundance and we take so much of that for granted. And I don't think any of us are cavalier, but when we talk to families about, well, here's a food box. Now have a nice meal, but inside the food box is whole products that they may not have a can opener. They right. they may not have the proper ways of preparing it. And more importantly is culturally, they may not have any uh, sense of affinity for those foods. Those, that, right. those are not their foods. It's not the foods they're familiar with. And um, if we don't take into account all of those considerations, we're just not serving our community in a way that will, again, nourish all of us and bring us to that next level where we're all being treated well and, uh, you know, being treated with respect and dignity. So there's many moving parts to Urban Seeds. We we are working on policy, both locally and at a state level. Hmm. Uh, you know, the big food machine is going at 100 miles an hour, and we're trying yeah. to slow it down a little bit. And so it's a complex a machine, too. And it's it's built on greed, unfortunately, uh, without a lot of consideration for the, the human effect of, um, you know, that big disparity in access. Uh, so while I'm not expecting to change the USDA, we are looking at things mm -hmm. uh, that we can make a difference on here in Evansville and uh, surrounding areas. Um, so that's a policy level, but we're looking at teaching everything from this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those folks who may be living with abundance to understand the depth of disparity in, as I talked about, you know, everything from paying utility bills to uh, kitchen tools. But uh, the other side of that education coin is how do we teach families who truly want to be part of their own uplift? You know, they, they want to become resilient. Right. How do we teach them to shop and cook on a budget and make meals that are not going to take hours in the kitchen, but are uh, whole foods based, you know, as opposed to just opening up a bunch of cans and um, packages, which there's a place for those foods as well. But we really want to bring more produce into families' lives and, and you know, and, and more whole foods. Then another aspect of that is how do we support our local growers? So many mm -hmm. people... You know, like our market on Maine, which Urban Seeds is the big part of, that's going to open next Wednesday downtown. Fabulous farmer's market, as is the Franklin Street Bazaar. We also support that mm -hmm. uh, on Saturdays. And, you know, tooling around the market is is nifty, you know, if you spend 10 bucks or whatever. Um, but for those of us who know our farmers and are dedicated to shopping for local produce, that means that, one, we're eating seasonally. I don't eat blueberries that come from Chile in January. Mm -hmm. I, and not because I'm smarter or better, but I've just understood the big impact of, uh, well, let's let's flip that. Let's talk about how positive it is when we do eat seasonally. So I will buy quarts and quarts and quarts of local blueberries uh, come July, and mm -hmm. then I wash them and I freeze them, and then I have blueberries all year long. Sure. But I've supported a local grower instead of, you know, having it shipped 3,000 miles, you know, and, and um, the whole environmental impact of that. So- 
we really look for ways to support our small local farmers. And the irony there is that the USDA calls the food we eat every day and food that's locally grown, they call that specialty crop. Whereas corn and soy, which is, you know, a commodity crop, that that's called farming. So mm-hmm. so it's it's a weird juxtaposition of what we bring to our table versus sure. what is fed to cows and made into paint thinner, you know, because yeah. that's what soy and corn do. So right. um, it, it's really complex. Uh, we believe we've broken it down into real um, friendly, bite-sized pieces. I'm happy to get in front of any group and talk about this in, in for 10 minutes or, you know, you know 10 weeks in a series. <laughs> uh, we do a, prior to COVID, we did a lot of hands-on cooking demonstrations. When when you bring people together around food, you create community. You create yeah. love. You 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 know when you can chop food together and smell it and then taste it together, it's mm-hmm. a beautiful thing. Yeah, because so, we all eat. Yes, something yes. we all have in common. And that's another whole piece. And you and I, we all three of us mentioned our busy lives. You know, before we went live here, um, when we slow down and are mindful about our meals. It changes our relationship with food. It changes mm-hmm. our health around food. It changes our digestion. I, I was blessed to be uh, in the cohort of the first TEDx speakers here in Evansville in 2015. Yeah, I, look it up if, if you want. I did a chocolate mindfulness exercise. Mm-hmm. So, oh, I remember hearing about this. Yeah, it, yeah. it was it was fun. Uh, and I, I think everybody do, got a free piece of yeah. chocolate if they were in the audience, right? Well, right, yeah. and then we we savored it over the course of uh, like a little Halloween yeah. size, but this right. was organic dark chocolate. Um, nonetheless, we 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 took three bites and savored every moment, mm-hmm. and um, and we don't need to go into that much detail. But when we are mindful about our meals, it changes our relationship. Uh, we're more appreciative, we're more grateful, mm-hmm. and again, it's the health benefits are innumerable. So right. You may have not ever thought that you could enjoy chocolate more than you already did, but correct, you can. <laughs> yeah, as we have shown. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's great. Yep. So I would love to know. Um, you've touched on it as you've gone, you know, just little snippets, but kind of this ideal scenario of Evansville, where a flourishing city, um, if all of your hopes and dreams were achieved for Evansville, can you kind of just give us a picture of what that would mm-hmm. look like? Well, uh, I'd say there's two pieces to that from my personal perspective. One is that we have a thriving, robust, and vibrant local food system that supports our local growers and producers and where there's equity and equality for all in terms of access and enjoying those foods. Mm. The other is that we use fewer single-use disposable items and we were really gaining some ground pre-covid we we uh, had some fabulous community listening sessions and uh, were in influencing big organizations so that when they were meeting instead of styrofoam heaven forbid styrofoam uh, mm-hmm. but instead of you know water bottles for instance and such sure. you know why can't we all get used to carrying our own cup around our own water bottle and COVID has changed a lot. I, I understand. And I, I right. assume we'll, we'll get back to some kind of normal eventually. Um, but the mentality about single use is, is really prevalent here. And, and mm-hmm. we don't have the luxury of throwing things away after one use. And, and those of you young folks with, you know, growing families, um, your children are the ones who will bear that burden. You know, all of us are responsible so how can we find a message that is compelling and yet challenging our community to be responsible about our choices uh, without judging and without, you know, wagging right. a finger right. because it can be done. Yeah. You know, it has been done in many other communities. So um, we are optimistic. So those would be my two best visions um, and I think it's important for me to clarify that I love it here. And there's, I have seen so much positive change in the almost eight years that I've been here that uh, I have every hope for the future in Evansville. Would you yeah. like to talk about some of those positive changes that you've seen over the years? Oh, so many. So, so again, w- with the food access piece, what, when I first got here, I started talking about plant-based eating, which I'm not promoting a hippy-dippy vegetarian way of life. But when we 
put more food on our plate that comes from plants than we do from animal product. Uh, we are eating in a way that we were intended to eat biologically, uh, and we're supporting the environment in a way that's also beneficial. And that fell on deaf ears largely uh, when I first started talking about it. So there's much more receptivity in that regard. Uh, when I, 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 you all know Lynn Miller Peace as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to a voice like my third week in town. Uh, and voice is a listening session. Yes, yes. Did. And uh, I, there were like 200 people. I, I knew only a, like one or two from Urban Seeds. And um, the mayor started, and I couldn't believe I was in the same room with the mayor. You know, for me, that was like <laughs> superstardom. And, and Lloyd's just such a good guy, you know, so warm and, and friendly. And then Lynn got up and just dazzled me. And I was like, I have to be that woman's friend, you know. And, and sure enough, we have become good friends. Uh, and she's very dear to me. But when I went to the, well, I signed up to be a volunteer for Voice. And I said, can we look at what we're eating our food on next time? And then I took it to the next level because I happen to cook and teach cooking. Can I be part of the food choices? So the next voice session, um, we brought plates from home. A whole bunch of us each brought like 10 or 12 plates and silverware and cups from home. And uh, we found a caterer who looked at all plant-based foods. Again, I'm not trying to convert anybody to, to uh, giving up meat. But when you have plant-based foods, you require less, fewer utensils. Hmm. So we had vegetable skewers and like chunks of cheese and, and all of that. Uh, and people commented on the dishware and how charming it was to have like 12 or 15 different patterns because yeah. everybody brought right. stuff. Yeah. And then all of us who brought plates and such from home, we all just schlepped it back home and washed it. I mean, it, was it slightly a bit of work? Sure. But it it made a real impression on everybody yeah. who was there. So we did it the next time. And those are the kinds of positive changes that I have seen. And it's not rocket science. It's not innovative. But it just hadn't been considered, at least at a large scale, that I had uh, been aware of. And, you know, once people feel good about their modeling of their own behavior, mm -hmm. it's catchy. You know, and then more and more people are going to want to engage. Yeah, that's really good. Can you talk a little bit about how um, access to good food affects other aspects of a person's life. I mean, I know that, uh, you, you know, you mentioned um, that children and their development and things like that are affected by the types of food that they have access to. What are some of the other areas of a person's life that um, will either improve with access to good quality food or where uh, they're going to face some challenges in the long run because they haven't had access to good quality food. There is is uh, absolute science that shows that children who later become adults who have grown up on ha highly processed, packaged, low nutritional value foods will be uh, at a at risk for a host of health concerns. So not only is brain chemistry affected, so children are more uh, chaotic in their brain chemistry from mm -hmm. food dyes and artificial sugars. Uh, but your satiation hormone is is affected when you eat a lot of processed sugars in particular and processed carbohydrates, meaning you don't get to turn off your hunger or or your your signal that you're you've had enough to eat. Hmm. So t people then tend to overeat. Uh, and that leads to obesity, which leads to diabetes, which leads to heart disease. I, I know when we were first looking at moving here, and I did some research, at that point, uh, Evansville and Indiana had like the highest rate of obesity and diabetes in the country. That's since been surpassed by whatever, uh, Mississippi or Alabama or something. Sure. But we're still in the top, you know, five. Uh, so there's such a risk for physiologic disease. But... For those people who grow up and are familiar with less nu lower nutritional value foods, uh, there's mood changes. There's uh, not only cognitive uh, deficiencies, but there's higher propensity for anxiety, uh, inability to focus. Um, we know that you know mental health is so multifaceted and complicated, right. but in mental health treatment, when true nourishment is given, there is are better outcomes. Right. Um, 
so you all, I'm sure, have have had too much coffee one day and not enough food because the days has gotten away from you, and you, and you feel edgy, you feel right. tense. That's not pleasant. Uh, and th- imagine if that's sort of your go to because you're mm-hmm. you're relegated to those kinds of foods all the while. Um, think of the social justice or lack thereof in schools when children were not allowed to have the regular lunch because their lunch bill was overdue by their parents. Now that's going by the wayside, thankfully, that that's being sure. done away with and, and now especially with USDA funding through COVID. Um, but imagine those children who get like a bologna sandwich when the rest of their co you know, their fellow students are getting some kind of hot meal, whatever it may be. Um, and, and that's just so hurtful to children. Yeah. So that that perpetuates that less than sensation, you know, mm-hmm. that they, they grow up with. And um, so there, there's many pieces to that. But when we don't feel respected and valued, that affects our mental health. When we're mentally low, we don't always make the best choices. Mm-hmm. And and what's most important to me is that children have no choice. They're, they're either given subsidized foods, either in schools or through um, food banks or community food share pantries, or uh, they, you know, are just whatever their parents are able to put together. And it's just an injustice to children to expect them to thrive well when they don't have the same access than uh, other kids that are two zip codes over and and whose parents just happen to be in a different situation. So um, it's imperative for me in my maturing years and as I one day will truly retire, um, that these last few years of my engagement uh, to advocate for those families who just can't find their own voice through no fault of their own. And right. that terrible, tired argument of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, it's mm-hmm. so unfair and so unjust, uh, in, unjust, pardon me. Um, and it's imperative, I, I think, that at, as a community, and I have said this to, to Zach Parsons and all my other good friends, pals who are so engaged in the community. Evansville is that perfect small city, big town where things happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen it. But if we come together around food access and we continue to pursue these initiatives that Urban Seeds and Health and Communities Partnership and Promise Zone and Wellborn Baptist Foundation and many of our partners, um, we don't require a lot of funding. We require some funding. But, you know, it's not that expensive to nourish our children hmm. and the the return on investment is just immeasurable and we'll have such a more vibrant healthy community in the long run if our children are well nourished and if they're treated with respect and dignity and their parents are invited into the conversation so i think i got off topic but but oh, the, but i've right. i've seen a lot of progress and you know our work is still in progress yeah so um, of our listeners, if people are listening and they want to do something, they're thinking, mm-hmm. this sounds really important. I want to, maybe they even want to start, and I'm thinking, this sounds great to eat locally and seasonally. The idea of eating seasonally is like really attractive <laughs> to me. Yes. So where, what can we do? What are some steps we can practically take today? So we have a wonderful website, urbanseeds.org. We have an active farmer page where we list all the local growers within a hundred mile radius, uh, where they what they grow and where they sell. When you buy directly from a farmer, either at a farmer's market or many of them now have their own websites, they get to keep all that money. And mm. I assure you, our farmers are not they're not rolling in the dough. They <laughs> they work really really hard, long yeah. hours, and they barely get by. When you buy from a third party, like a, a online platform that intervenes in terms of creating the platform and making it easier at some level for the consumer, they take a cut of what the farmer gets. So I would encourage you to connect directly with farmers if at all possible. Uh, There are a couple small stores in Evansville that sell local produce. One of them is Elbert's Natural Foods on Virginia. It's my favorite stores where I go. Um, It's out of the way for some people, but our two farmer's markets, I I mentioned Franklin Street Bazaar on Saturdays and the market on Main downtown at the Ford Center on Wednesdays. Uh, You have an abundant of uh, choices from local farmers, um, meat 
p- providers, daring mm-hmm. eggs, et cetera. Uh, so that's an important opportunity for you as well. And a fun opportunity. Shopping yes. at a farmer's yes. market uh, is way better yes. than going to the grocery store. Well, that, that, that is true. And our big box stores here locally don't sell uh from local growers just yet. That's part of the policy that we're working on to Mm. change because there there are a lot of regulations that that are sort of restrictive and unnecessary and we're working on that uh, here. So first point would be to see what you can do to connect locally with Mm. a farmer. Um, You know, eating seasonally uh, can feel like a a little bit of a deprivation when you see strawberries that come in from a a foreign country in the middle of the winter. You know, think about that and and then plan ahead. So strawberries are in season right now. Go buy a flat, wash them, take the stem off, cut them, put them in the freezer, and you'll be happy come January. You know, that that's another uh, option. Uh, we have a volunteer sign up on our Urban Seeds website. I would also encourage you to go to Healthy Communities Partnership. They're, we're a proud partner of HCP. Uh, and, and volunteer opportunities are listed there as well. Um we have fundraisers that always involve food. We do a community uh, food share. So when we sell soup or a casserole, we donate an equal amount. So we, we donate typically through Aurora or the YWCA to those families that mm. receive services. Um, so you buy dinner for your own family, but another family gets dinner as oh, well. Great. So uh, there's lots of ways that you can engage and um, learn more. And I'd also encourage you to invite me or one of my colleagues to come and talk to your service club or, or any group, church group, whatever, uh, so that we can you know, be a little more um, specific about how you might engage. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's really great. I love um, hearing your story and hearing how you've um, taken this passion for, you know, just quality food and how it contributes to a quality life and um, sharing that with the community, getting it out there, spreading it and and thinking about what needs to change so that pe- more people can have access to really good foods and not just, you know, it would be easy um to move from somewhere else into Evansville to to recognize, which I should say, this is not just an Evansville problem. Um, the the um, difference in access to food among you know higher income neighborhoods versus lower income neighborhoods is a trend that we see in cities all over the place. Um, but it would be easy to come into a community and to see that and, and to say, ah, oh, that's just kind of something that's too bad and. Uh, kind of sad that that's the way it is here in Evansville, but your approach has been, you know, what can I do to get involved and to move the needle? And, and so I love hearing that. I hope people are inspired by that and um, can see that, you know, that's, that's just something that you were passionate about that you looked for opportunities to get, to get involved and, and have gotten involved. So, yes. Well, I have been inspired, which is what allows me then to share that back. Right. Yeah. And so hopefully people who are listening to this, if they're interested in um, in this food conversation, that they'll do the research, learn more. Um, if if they want to get connected with you, they can find you through Urban Seeds yeah. or reach out to us as well. And we'd love to help you get connected um, to Urban Seeds and to other organizations. And then if you're interested in something else, I hope you're inspired by this story and and begin looking for those opportunities. What's the what's the niche? What's the area that you can kind of step in and, and get involved? Would you have any um, final advice for anybody who is kind of still searching for those opportunities of, uh, you know, I, I want to get involved in Evansville. Maybe I see an area of need that's, that's really, um, uh, you know, resonating with me, or maybe I have something that I'm passionate about and I want to bring something of value to the city and contribute? What what guidance in general would you give somebody who's in that place? I have found that anything is possible and, and to not hold back on big ideas. And I am just impressed continually and touched and inspired by the goodness that abounds here. There's so many people who care. So it 
for anybody listening who wonders what they might do, everything is the perfect amount. Nothing is too small. Uh, don't feel overwhelmed that you have to become a board member or that you must donate a certain amount of hours or a certain amount of dollars. It, every little thing we do for other people when we give of ourselves, it makes such a big difference. Yeah, that's great. Oh, thanks so much for joining us today. We're so happy that you're here giving us your little nuggets of wisdom. My Thank pleasure. You. Yeah.